let's take the next four weeks to kind of go through this theory called Hoosier One. We're going to talk about the importance of really our ministry, our job as followers of Christ and um, the importance of that. And so I want to begin by asking a question to all of us to think about, to ponder as we begin this series. And it's, when you strip everything else away, what's at the core of who you are and what you do and where you go to church? What's at the very core of it? And so I, wanna, I want us to think about that because it's really a simple answer. But I want to lay out some truths to us to under, help us kind of better see what is it, who we are, what are we doing, and what is the core of all that we try and accomplish. And it really comes down to one thing, and that is to make Jesus known to the world. And so my prayer is that we will see clearer this year than in past years what God has said we are, who we are, what he said we are to do, and where we're to go as we follow him. And, you know, I can kind of, and used to play on words here, Vision 2020, you know, that we can see clearly. I don't know about you. I would love to have 2020 vision again. All right. I wouldn't have to wear these glasses that my kids seem to smash on my face every time they try and hug me or try and pull my arm off or whatever. They always seem to grab my glasses and keep telling them they don't have $500 to replace those. But the reality is, as we think about this year, 2020, is I want us just to step back and be able to see clear the picture of what God has called us to do because of who he is and who he believes we are. So I want to start by kind of a little word association game. You'll love these things here in our brain thinking. I want to prime the, the pump here, get you guys thinking this morning. I know you're like, oh, Pastor, you've got to think this morning. All right, we, got, we came to listen to you, we're not to have to think about things. We're wrong, not this morning. So I want you to think about this word association. I'm going to say a phrase, and I want you to think of the first image that comes to mind. And don't say it, though. Don't blurt it out, okay? <laughs> don't blurt it out. Just think of it, all right? So the first image that pops to your mind when I say Bernie Sanders supporter. Looks on your face, tell all, all right? How about a Trump supporter? All right, uh, how about when I say vegan? Or meat lover? Pie lover? I'm sure the first is Pastor Harry, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Which, by the way, I have to brag on my daughter. She, uh, this Christmas, went online shopping for me and she bought me this awesome t shirt that I'm going to have to preach in one. It's got a big pie on it, it says pie till I die. So, you know, she knows me a little too well. You know, um, how about when you say, um, what comes to mind is an image when you say Pats fan, disappointing. <laughs> or a Celtics fan, well, at least we got the Celtics and the Bros, right? Okay, we can keep moving. Let's go in New Englanders. All right, how about for you young people, how about I, or maybe older people, when I say Star Wars, do you think of the new Star Wars trilogy or do you think of the original when it came out? Do you think of Luke Skywalker or do you think of uh, Red? I, you know, Star Wars is a big thing nowadays. All right, so. Think of those in the word association here. I want you guys to think, what's the first thing that pops to your mind when I say the word Christian? What does it come to mind when you hear the word Christian? Andy Stanley, a Bible teacher in Atlanta, says, if you ask 10 different people, you're probably going to get at least nine different answers, at least here in America, of what a Christian is. So you would say that at some point in your life you became a Christian. If that's how some of you would answer it, there was a point in your life when you prayed a prayer, walked an aisle, got baptized, maybe went into a confirmation class, maybe you had some sort of tradition that you you, you uh, prepared you for being a Christian. Others of you say you've always been a Christian since you were born into a Christian home and you've always been to the church. There are some of you, though, in fact, maybe some of you listening right now, watching right now, who would say, no, I am definitely not a Christian. One guy was asked to define Christianity, someone who doesn't go to church or anything, and this is what he said. It's very intriguing. But he said, Christians are judgmental, homophobic moralists who think that they are the only ones going to heaven and secretly relish the fact that everybody else is going to hell. But that's the in from. Is being Christian enough? The title of my message this morning, because the reality is, 
We're not called to be Christians. We're not called to be Christians. Consider this, the word Christian is only used three times in the entire Bible. By contrast, the word disciple is used 281 times in the New Testament alone. Another strange and interesting fact is the word Christian, all right, was a derogatory term. It wasn't used to say, hey, I'm a Christian, hello, you know. It was actually a name given to the disciples in Acts chapter 11 because they were different by the non-Christians. It wasn't something they called themselves. If you read Acts 11, 26, it actually says they were disciples. They referred to them as disciples of Jesus. So you might say, well, so what? Andy Stanley once again says, and I agree with him, I want to suggest to you that in changing the primary word that we use to describe ourselves, we lost the clarity that the word disciple conveyed about a follower, of what a follower of Jesus actually is. And so going to the heart of this, back to Matthew chapter 4, we're going to look at this context, and we're going to think about this. Is it just enough to say I'm a Christian? Because in our culture, in our country, to say Christian could mean many things. Are you a Mormon Christian? Are you a Jehovah's Witness Christian? Are you a Methodist Christian? Are you a Lutheran Christian? All right? Christian has become a hodgepodge of things today. So is it enough to be a Christian? Is it enough to want others to be Christian? Does that mean morally right? Does that mean morally pure? But we're not supposed to be Christian. Christian is not enough. See, we've been called to be disciples. Look what Jesus says. He said, come, follow me, and I will make you, or I will send you out to fish for other people. All right? Our job is not to just be Christian. We're called to be disciples. Now, I want to give some background to this because this will make a lot more sense than some guy coming up to you and going, hey, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. All right? We got to get context here. All right? Back in the, the, the culture of the day, every Jewish boy... At the age of five, went to Torah school. Every boy. There was no hesitation. Every boy went to Torah school. All right? And for the next five years, the boys would learn the Torah, the Old Testament. They would memorize it, meditate on it, learn every in and out of it. And at age 10, all right, the best students, those that were the cream of the cream, the creme de, creme, the creme, de la creme, the top well, then the rose up there, the new better than everybody else, would carry on, and everybody else, because you weren't good enough, would be sent home. They would weed out those that were lacking. And at age 17, if the boy wanted to go on and make a career out of religious studies, which, by the way, at this time and period, was the highest, most, uh, best job to have in the world. Being a cleric, being a, being a rabbi was, was, was like the top. I mean, you think about it today, it'd be like, you know, the Bill Gates of the day. I mean, we're talking about these were the, the best places to be. And at 17, if a boy wanted to go make a career out of it, his next step would be find a rabbi he admired and apply to become one of his Talmud. The, the Hebrew Talmud is basically the word disciple. Okay? When he found one, he would go and sit at his feet. That was a sign of honoring back then. He'd go down and he'd say, Harvey, I want you, I want to be your disciples. He'd go and just sit at his feet. He'd just go sit. That was a request to learn. And the rabbi would examine him with questions and put him through a series of tests to see if he was worthy to be his disciple. All right? The rabbis could choose the smartest, most talented boys to be the disciples. They made a choice based on what they knew, how well they knew it, how well they dressed and followed it to the letter of the law. And they chose them to be their followers. Another reason the rabbis were so picky is that when the, they chose a disciple, they were choosing someone who they believed could become just like them. To not just know what they know, but to do what they did. So for several years, these young boys, these Talmuds, would follow their rabbis, imitating them in every way. The goal of a disciple was to be like the rabbi. They would learn their mannerisms. They would learn how they answer certain questions. They would learn how to respond in situations. Think of this. 
The highest compliment you could pay a Talmud in those days was to say to them, listen to this phrase, I don't know if great, the dust of your rabbi is all over you. That wasn't like saying, hey man, you need a shower. That was like saying, whatever the rabbi stepped, it sprayed up on you. That's how closely you fall in. Everything your rabbi does, you do. You get covered with it. You're saturated in it. Now, one more thing about this culture in this day and age, and in the background here, is that there was a rare form of rabbi that possessed a characteristic that the Jews called shmiha. All right? So it's a Hebrew word. All right, can everybody say it with me? Shmiha. Shmiha, all right? Shmiha basically means authority. Shmiha, all right? He was one who was recognized um, uh, because of certain things that he did. They were very rare. Uh, we only know of a few, and a couple of you might know Jewish history, uh, Hillel and Gamaliel, who was the trainer of Paul, the apostle, all right? But these guys had shmiha. They had authority, all right? They were masters of the Torah. They were mystical. They had a spiritual authority that they could give the interpretations of texts. They were thought to be so close to God that they could give new, unheard of insights into Scripture. You know, for Jewish people, they weren't into new stuff. They, everything they needed to know, they always had known, they assumed. So new stuff was frowned upon. But these rabbis were shmiha. They were the authority. They had the ability to say, you didn't understand this, but I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to tell you what this really says. They had that shmiha, all right? They were empowered because they could do things, all right? There was evidence that they had the shmiha was that they had done miracles. There was credible, credible evidence that the, that the things of their life were different. Uh, what they said was had a power. So when we come to Matthew chapter 4, here is Jesus. And it says that when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew and he began teaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now Jesus is going to be one that has shmiha. Because if you go to the end of chapter 7, after the end of his great preaching, it says this. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Because he has taught as one who had shmiha. And not as the teachers of the law. We also know at the end of chapter 4, it says he performed miracles, and everybody brought him to him. So Jesus was this new into this new rabbi, all right? And he was, he was going and he was calling people to be him. Jesus had authority. He had shmiha sauce. Now think about this, all right? John the Baptist had shmiha. He had that dripping all over him because people drove to him to get baptized, all right? But John the Baptist says something very important for all of us. He says, there's someone in this crowd who is greater than me, and I'm not even worthy to untie his shoelaces. I have some shmiha, but there's somebody in this crowd right here today who has greater shmiha than me. Listen to him. Follow him. And right after that, Jesus came, he was baptized, and the dove descended upon him, and God said, behold, this is my son, in whom I well pleased. He was declared by God to have the greatest shmiha. I don't know about you, but you know how those signs go on your board? You got your little regulators, got a little energy. You know, John the Baptist, little shmiha sauce went like this, but when Jesus came to it, to the other side, shmiha, shmiha, shmiha. He had it. And when Jesus came up to these disciples and he said, Follow me, it wasn't like he was some schmo off the side of the road that just walked up and said, Hey, would you follow me? We're just going to go and do some cool things. There was something about him. And in this culture, there was something that people, these kids looked up to and longed for the idea of being a rabbi, following a rabbi, being a disciple. Why? Because it got them a better life. And here, Peter, James, John, Andrew, all these disciples who were fishermen, they got a Torah school. They had sought to be a rabbi and they were cast off. And here Jesus comes and he says, follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. I will make you fishers of men. So I want to know, 
couple things, five things about this idea of being a disciple, about it being Christian, about the call that God has put on our life. If you have accepted Christ, if you come to the place in your life where you've received the gospel, God has said, you are my disciple, and this is what's required of you. This is what I want for you. The first thing is, Jesus didn't choose the best. He chose, he chooses the willing. He doesn't choose the best. All right. As he was walking along, you know, he sees two brothers, Simon and Andrew. They were casting their net. All right. Jesus looks at Peter and Andrew and he says, follow me. They were part of what? We would call them the B team. You know, in basketball, you have the A team, which are all the good players that have all the abilities, and you have the B team. The B team were those kids who were kind of all right, you know, they were, you know, they, they kind of had it going on. I strived as a high school basketball player to make the varsity basketball team. I worked really hard as a five foot eleven center. Get the limit, another upper five foot eleven center. I played against six foot six and six foot eight guys. All right, I tried hard, but I didn't have enough skills to make the the A team, the varsity team. So I got stuck on the B team, the junior varsity team. I was just a junior. I was not as good as the others. All right, that's what this was. Is they all gone? Everyone, everyone in this culture had gone to to, to, to war school. And only a few were selected to go on and become disciples of the rabbis. So Jesus comes along and he selects the B team. Let that sink in. When Jesus chose his squad to build his movement, he didn't choose the best of the best, the creme de la creme. He chose the B team. Why? See, the rabbis chose the guys who had great abilities, great power, great you know, looked at greatly. But Jesus chose people without much potential, without personal power to follow him. Why? Because his work in the world wouldn't come from their abilities for, for him, but from what he could do through them. It had nothing to do with who they were. See, people with a lot of talent and ability would only get in the way because they would never learn to lean on the power of God. Jesus taught that his power in the weakest vessel was infinitely greater than the greatest talent without him. If you look over at Matthew chapter 11, Jesus references this idea. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 9 to 11, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Think about that. I bet you Jesus' favorite preacher was John the Baptist. If you if he had an iPod back then, he probably had every sermon John ever preached on. And he listened to it nonstop. He would hand down the best preacher. I would tell you what, he probably said to people, you need to go listen to what John the Baptist has said, because he's preaching the truth. Think about that. He says, the one who is least in my kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. Think about that for a moment. Least in the kingdom of heaven, it means you know the least about the Bible. It means you have the least talent. It means you have the least, you are the least eloquent. It means you have the least amount of spiritual gifts. Somebody that I'm talking to you right now, somebody in this room, is the least of the kingdom of God at Small Point Baptist Church. And I'm not trying to be mean, but mathematically someone has to be the least, right? One of you has the least talent. You're the least capable. You're the least eloquent. You know the least about the Bible. Right now you're thinking, I think he might be talking to me. And God in heaven is like, yep, that's you. You're right. You're at the bottom of the pile. Even if that's accurate. Even if that's accurate, you, whoever you are, have more potential for power ministry than John the Baptist did. Let that sink in for a minute. The least of the kingdom will be greater than John the Baptist. And Jesus, Jesus looked at him as the greatest preacher. Why? Because you've got something that John didn't have. You have the Holy Spirit in you. Jesus said from that point on, it was no longer going to be about your abilities for Jesus. It was about your ability to be available for Jesus. Because he didn't choose you because you had a great dad. He didn't choose you because you had the great witness and great power to speak. He didn't choose you because you could be a great preacher. 
He chose you because he knew that you'd be a willing vessel that he could work through. The Holy Spirit in the mouth of one believer is more powerful than any army of the most eloquent orators in the world. Do you get that? God wants to use you and your family. He wants to use you in your workplace. He wants to use you in your neighborhood, in your community. You need to stop making excuses that you're not able because you are able because Jesus is giving you everything you need for life and godliness. He doesn't need your ability. He only requires your availability. As we often say, he doesn't, he doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. Have you made yourself available? You see, Jesus doesn't choose the best. He chooses the willing. Are you willing? I remember as a 17-year-old high school boy when God called me to the ministry. I was the quiet kid in youth group, and I know none of you believe that. Right? I was the quiet kid. I was the shy kid. I was the kid who sat back in the corner and said, no, I'm not going to do anything. And when it came time for a youth group Christmas play, I took the easy part. The one-liner at the beginning of it where I said a prayer, and that was it. I was done for the whole play. I did my part, I served, Woo! I'm not be quiet. And Paul writes in Corinthians, he said, God didn't choose the wise things, he chose the unwise. He didn't choose the strong, he chose the weak. Why? To confound the wise and the strong. Because it has nothing to do with who we are, but who he is. Amen. God called us to be disciples, not because of our ability, but because of our availability. Amen. Are you willing this morning? Your awesomeness was going... And it come from his power in you. So the question is not how able are you? The question is how available are you? Have you surrendered yourself to him saying, God, I'm going to stop making excuses. And I'm going to quit looking into my family, into my marriage, into my ministry, into my workplace and asking, what can I do? I'm going to start asking, what can Jesus do? That brings me to the point number two. Not only did he choose the willing, it says here, he chose us, not me, him. He chose us. He said, follow me. He said, Peter, Andrew, follow me. He chose them. As I explained, the normal way this went down is that you were among the best of the class. You applied to the rabbi. If you liked what he saw, he chose you back. Now, his selection gave them a great deal of confidence. If, you, if they were struggling, they could say, ah, but my rabbi believed in me. He chose me. But Jesus started the process back even further. They didn't even come sit at his feet. He came seeking them when they weren't even looking for him. Get that? Jesus came to you. He came searching you out. That's why Mark says Jesus didn't come to save, you know, to serve, or to be served, but to serve, to seek, and to save those who are lost. He came looking for us. He chose them when they weren't even looking for him. He came seeking them when they didn't really have an idea that they could be his disciples. Do you understand what kind of confidence that was supposed to give them? One of the things you notice if you read the New Testament is how many times and how many how often Jesus and the apostles bring up this concept that he chose us as a means of installing confidence. We, we went through the book of Ephesians. And we studied the very first chapter. It says he chose us. Paul's developing the theme that you didn't choose God, he chose you. Later in John chapter 16, as, the, his, as Jesus is giving his final words to the disciples, he says, you did not choose me, I chose you to be my disciples. I looked at you. Here's what Jesus says. I will give you my words. I appointed you that you might go and bear fruit. Bear fruit means you're going to win other people to Jesus. And your fruit will last. It's not just going to be a temporary thing. It's going to be a permanent, real, eternal fruit. So that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. When Jesus says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you, his main point is not, hey, guys, I'm a Calvinist. His main point is saying that I chose you when I have planned for you and purpose for you. I'm going to pursue you, and I'm not going to let it drop. So when you lack confidence in yourself, you should put confidence in my purposes in you, because even if you falter, they will never fail. That's why in Philippians, says, he who began a work, good, uh, work in you will be faithful to complete it. He started. He's going to work on it. Think about it. Where's our confidence? We know if it's in our ability, we're going to fail. 
A lot of times we talk about we lost our confidence in Jesus, but it's not really our confidence in Jesus we've lost. We've lost was our confidence that Jesus would do through us what he said he would do. Think about Peter on the boat. Remember that night they're out on the fishing house and Jesus comes walking on the water to them? And Peter says, it's the Lord. If it is you, call me out. And Jesus says, yeah, come on out. So what does Peter do? He gets out of the boat and starts walking on water. I don't know about you, but that would be really cool. Mm-hmm. All right? What was it that Peter began to sink, though? Was it because he lost confidence in who Jesus was? No, it's when he took his eyes off who Jesus was and started looking around him. He saw the things. He began to sink and he said, save me. Some of you are struggling now. We're struggling in our marriages. We're struggling in our career. We're struggling as parents. Lord knows I struggle as a parent sometimes. Believe it, friend. If you are Jesus' disciple, then he chose you, and he will give you the ability to accomplish the task set forth before you as a godly husband, as a godly wife, as a godly mother or father, grandparent. He will give you the ability. He said, I appointed you to go and produce fruit that will remain. So how do we do that? See, God has chosen us to be his disciples, not to, to be Christians. He's called us to be disciples. So what is it? Point three, our primary calling that is to be with him. Our primary calling is to be with Jesus. As a disciple, a disciple is someone, as we looked at, who studies and imitates and follows hard after his master. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. It isn't me that you're supposed to follow. It's Christ you follow. My job as your shepherd is to point you to the good shepherd, the true shepherd, the one shepherd, who will lead you next to the river, uh, you know, next to green pastures, who will fill your cup, according to the 21st Psalm. Here's the cool thing. When he said, follow me, he didn't tell them where they were going or what assignment he had for them. His primary call is not to do something, it's to become like him. To become like him, you have to know him. To know him, you have to know his word. You all say, yeah, I want to be like Jesus. I want to do something great for Jesus. How much time do you spend in his word? Daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. You know, if uh, you know, could you imagine a relationship where you wanted to marry someone and you, they sat over there and you said, hey, say hi, hi, I'm going to marry that person, but you never spent any time together. Would that ever work out? Well, of course, it's arranged like back in the old days. You were forced to do it. But no, typically, you, know, the, you spend time with each other, you get to know each other, you, you fall in love together, and through that, you, your relationship builds so close that you get married, hopefully, you know. The more you know someone, the more you love someone. How can we love Jesus if we never spend any time with Jesus? Remember that phrase, the, the phrase about does the dust of your rabbi, is it all over? Do you want the dust of Jesus all over you? Do you want Jesus' shmiha all over you? Think about it. In Matthew 28, all authority, all shmiha in all the earth and heaven has been granted to me, and I'm giving it to you. Go and make this up teaching them. Baptizing and teaching them all things. All Shmiha, all authority has been given to you. If you want that all over you, if you want that Shmiha in your life, then you're going to have to have his word saturated inside of you until it dominates all your thinking and all your behavior, until you think it and you talk it and you quote it. And as often as, and, and as we often might say, when your life cuts you, you just bleed God's word. When life is hard and you're troubled, you bleed God's word. When hard hardships fall upon you, the first thing that comes to your mouth is, God is faithful. He is my rock, my refuge, my strong tower. I will run to him. You cannot know Jesus any more than you know his word. That's why Paul writes to young Timothy, young preacher, in 1 Timothy chapter Five. Excuse me. Second Timothy. Get this. Chapter four. In the presence of God and Christ, who will judge the living and the dead in the view of His appeared 
In his teaching, I give you this charge, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not, will not put up with sound doctrines. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of the evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Back in chapter 6, he says, excuse me, 1 Timothy 4, command and teach these things, verse 11. Verse 12, do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, here it is, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which has been given through the prophecy when the body of others laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them, so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You've got to spend time in His Word. You've got to know His Word. Our primary calling is to be with Him. What are some outlets that we have here at this church that we have given to you so you can be in His Word? Foundation Group, Sunday morning. We're studying the book of Revelation. That's an opportunity for you to be in His Word and, and study and learn about His redemptive work coming in the end. There's ladies' Bible studies. There's men's Bible studies. We have our fellowship groups. Why? Because we want to encourage you to surround yourself and be in the Word of God. If you're not willing to go and be part of them, why aren't you? Because if you love Jesus, you want to know Jesus, you're going to spend time taking advantage of every aspect and every opportunity to know Him. We spend countless hours watching the next episode of our favorite shows so we can know what's going to happen. Yeah, when Jesus says, I want you to know my truth, you don't spend more than 15 minutes reading his word. Do you want the dust of your rabbi to be all over you? Do you want people when they see you to see, man, there's something different about him? Do you know why in Acts chapter 11 they were called Christians? It's because they were different than the Jews. They called them Christians. They didn't call them just Jews anymore. They didn't call them disciples. They were Christians. Why? Because it was derogatory. Because they were different. When people call you a Christian, do they just lump you in with the whole sum of the world's idea of Christianity? Or they look at you and say, no, you're a follower of that Jesus freak. You're following that Jesus guy. Why? Because his shmiha is all over you. Because you're available to follow him and you spend time with him because you know it's only by his power. And first, Second Peter 1, 3 says, his divine power is giving you everything you need for life and godliness. Everything. His divine shmiha. Think about that for a second. Everybody wants the power of a god in our culture, in our, in our, in our world. They want to be like the gods, yet we have the power power of God dwelling in us. We have the divine Shmiha dwelling in us. Yet we don't tap into it. We don't release it. We don't pray believing that it has the, the power to change lives. It's not because we lost confidence in it. It's because we lost sight of him. Amen. A disciple is someone who knows his calling is to be with Jesus. And he will do everything he can to come and learn from his word, to be in it, to read it, to study it. Do you want to know why Christianity has become more popular or less popular? Or the idea of coming to church becoming less popular? Because we have lost sight of the importance of being with Jesus. It isn't about coming to a place to gather in a building. We gather here this morning to be with Jesus. To learn about Jesus, to be his disciples so that we can go into all the world in his power and share the gospel. That we can look and say, who's our one? Who's my one that I need to pray for and have God work in? This Who's Your One campaign isn't for the, the weak of heart. This is a commitment to be who God calls us to be, a disciple. Because he said, I will make you fishers of men. I will send you out to fish for people. It isn't just to become a Christian. 
They just send you out to be a disciple to make other disciples. That's what the Shmiha is supposed to be in our lives. So what does that mean for us? Point number four, to follow him, we have to leave all. It says here that he called Peter and John, they were fishing, they were casting their nets, they were mending their nets, and it says immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Immediately. Wouldn't that be nice if our kids, if we told them to do something, immediately did it? Or would you pass out? <laughs> would you like be thinking, what, what, they did it immediately? Immediately is the idea of service. The idea of, yes, I'm going to go, boom, I'm gone, I'm going to do this, I'm paying attention. It says immediately they left their boat and their follow, father and followed him. Why identify these two specific things? Number one, boat was their careers, the way we take care of ourselves. And secondly, father, which means our most significant relationships. To follow Jesus, he has to take precedence over both of these. Most of you won't literally lose your father or mother over Jesus. Some people might. I mean, I know of Christians in uh, India and um, the Middle East, even here in our country, who are Muslims, who become Christians, are excommunicated from their families. Some of us, that won't happen. Maybe for some, God may tell you to change your career. He may say, no, I don't want you to do this. I want you to go do this. You stop what you're doing. I want you to be a missionary and go over here. That happens. Even later in life. I know of a lady who, who didn't follow her call, but when she retired, she recognized that she'd become a missionary, and she left and went to the mission field in her late, late 60s. To follow Jesus means he becomes the centermost part of your life. But for most of us, it won't be that dramatic. But you'll have moments when you decide which holds greater sway over your life. Maybe for you uh, young people, for you middle schoolers, you elementary school kids, you're going to be the only one, some of you, chooses to follow Jesus out of your set of friends. You're going to be labeled that religious chick or that religious dude, all right, or something else like that. And you're going to have to decide if you're going to sit back and be imitated uh, and be intimidated, or if Jesus has a larger presence in your life than those friends. Maybe some of you in business, you're going to be faced with temptation to cut some corners. You're going to uh, cheat. You're going to do something that isn't right because someone has aggravated you. You're going to have to be patient and do things God's way. For some of you, it's simply what do you do with your income? Scripture teaches in unequivocal terms that you give your first and your best to Jesus when you're his follower, which usually for Christians starts with the tithe or 10%. Amen. Do we give first to Jesus and then everybody else, or do we give out of what's left? A disciple says, no, I will trust you. Go back to Malachi. And you study Malachi, and it says that the, the priests were robbing God. And God said, no, put me to the test, that I will be faithful and provide for you. Put me to the test. How does Jesus have greater sway in our life? What is it that com competes with his position. You see, to follow him, we have to leave all. He has to become our number one priority. To be a disciple means I'm setting aside my other thoughts and my other ways, and I'm going to come sit at the feet of Jesus. Remember the story of Mary and Martha? Martha's all busy in the kitchen because she's trying to prepare this awesome meal because Jesus is coming to her house. And Mary, what does she do? She should be helping her sister, but she goes and she sits down at the feet of Jesus. Oh. It's kind of like what my kids do with the TV's on. Uh, isn't that what we do when the TV goes on? We become mesmerized. Uh, the football game last actually I had to turn away because I was like, oh, no. Edelman, you dropped the ball. How could you? How could you, Edelman? Oh, excuse me. All right. But the, the thing about it is, Mary came and sat at Jesus because she knew that this was greater than going to clean up a little bit. Coming to church on Sunday is greater than going fishing on Sunday. I know some of you officers would like to hear me, hear me say that. All right? Okay? But put God to the test. Go into Bible study. Go into prayer meeting. If you can get up to prayer meeting. Starting a new ministry. Reaching those in our community. Doing something outside. Putting that above our wants. To follow Jesus means we leave all. Number one, number five, as we close and get ready for communion this morning, he commands us to spiritually reproduce. 
It isn't just enough to follow me. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will send you out to fish for people. Your job is to come learn so you can go out and pass that shmiha onto other people so that they can come and know the power of God in their life. That's why Paul writes in, in Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God unto salvation. There's no greater way you can serve your neighbor, your friend, your 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 more co-workers than to love them with the gospel. To pray for them, the gospel makes a difference. To show them the power of the gospel. Following Jesus means you subject everything in your life to his lordship. You forsake all that, is, that he has forbidden to pursue all that he has prescribed. Just like he was a fisher of men, his followers would become fishers of men. This is an essential part of being a disciple. It's not something that only a few of us do. It's something that each of us do. There is no such thing as a non-reproducing Christian. A non-reproducing disciple. is someone who gets the message of God. So how do you prove you're a disciple? What does Jesus say in John 15? By bearing fruit. What's the fruit you're supposed to produce? Others in Christ. Jesus said, my Father is glorified by this, in John 15, 8, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Jesus tells his disciples how to bear fruit. By what? Going and making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. Why? Because all authority has been given to Jesus. All shmiha is Jesus. It isn't in President Trump. It isn't in the European nations. It isn't in the Pope. It isn't in me. It isn't in the power of our country. The real authority can only be found in Jesus Christ. Amen. The real authority over fear of death and dying and the unknown. The real authority that helps us to overcome cancer and helps us to, to walk through those battles in life, to overcome anxiety and depression. The real authority that helps us to, to understand and not have fear at all is in Jesus. And he calls us to go out and make disciples. Robert Coleman, in his book, The, the Master's Plan of Evangelism, he says, When will the church learn this lesson? Preaching to the masses, although necessary, will never suffice in the work of preparing leaders for evangelism. Nor can occasional prayer meetings and training classes for Christian workers do do the job. Individual women and men are God's method. God's plan for disciples is not something, but someone. See, our something, our classes, our training, is to equip us to be the someone to go and share the gospel with someone. It's personal. Personal. For God so loved the church building, for God so loved the the, the halls of worship, the temple, the altar, the, the Ark of the Covenant? No, he said, for God to love the world, the someones in this world. And we've been called to love them. You are God's method. You are God's way. It isn't about making more Christians, church, because being Christian is not enough. In our world today, Christianity has replaced the idea of discipleship. Of being a disciple, a follower of Christ. My question to you this morning is, are you a disciple? Have you gone and responded to God's call to be his disciple? He didn't wait for you to be the greatest and brightest and smartest and, and most eloquent of words. He said, I want you. I chose you. I want you to be my disciple so that I can bear fruit through you to the people and show my power, not your power. Because in your power, you can do nothing. But I can do all of it. Why? Because he is the great Shriha. Thank you, J.D. Greer, for counting that word in my head, Shriha. Disciple making is simply teaching someone to follow Jesus as you follow Jesus with the help of the Holy Spirit. Inviting them to come to a Bible study with you. Going to coffee and talking about Jesus with somebody. Can you imagine what it would look like if every one of the people in this room, in our church, and ask God, God, give me one person I could bring to Jesus. If every one of our small groups made it, if every one of our ministries made it, their goal to reach one purpose, one person, excuse me, for Jesus, 
If each one committed to reach one, what would our church be like? Would we see the power of God move in a way that is beyond our limits? Would we see the shmiha, the dust of our master, all over us? The question is, are you a disciple? Or are you just a church attender? Maybe you're here and you never become a member of the church yet. First step, become a member. Get involved. Get engaged. Why? Because you want to grow and know your Savior so you can be used to reach the world around you. There's someone around you that needs Jesus because the Shmiha of Jesus is ours.